Hello, I'm Jane Button. Tonight I'll be reporting on a new bone bank which began operating today here at Lingard Private Hospital. Bone will be stored for use in orthopaedic surgery. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. Newcastle's annual bread show is the oldest in Australia that's still going. It's more than 50 years old. As far as bread shows go, it's one of the major shows in New South Wales, and this year a record entry of more than 1,000 exhibits were entered. Entries came from hot bread shops, plant bakeries and cake shops, and their work was judged in 29 different classes. For the judges, it was a busy day today selecting the top entries in each class. The bread is judged for four characteristics, volume and general appearance, texture, aroma or flavour and crumb colour. The champion loaves this year went to Parkfield Bakery Mayfield, Darrell's Bakery Wyong, Mylot's Bakery Maruya and the most successful exhibitor was Summer Centre Hot Bake Orange. Head judge Arthur Dennison holds the world record for judging with 308 exhibitions under his belt in his 39 years experience. And it doesn't matter what loaf of bread you pick today, it's a nutritious piece of food. Because bread today is more nutritious and better than what it was 20, 30 years ago. Arthur, is there, is there such a thing as a perfect loaf of bread? I've never ever seen one. Late yesterday afternoon, final preparations and touch-ups were being made to the many exhibitions and sideshow alley. Today's opening of the four-day event is expected to attract a crowd of 25,000. Though organisers say they're hoping that number will exceed 140,000 before the show winds up on Sunday. The grounds are in perfect condition for centre ring action. Well, and President of the show committee, Clem Varley, says this year's fair has more to offer than ever before. Well, we have Palo on, on Saturday and Sunday, three-man aside Palo, a competitive event. We haven't had Palo for about uh, ten years. We have the Sky High Comedy Show, which is an aerial acrobatic show in the uh, centre ring, plus the numerous uh, free attractions, including Big Dog at the 2HD NBN Pavilion. What about some of the displays? Well, the wool pavilion in this year particularly is, is great. There's been great upgrading of the, uh, the wool, the agricultural pavilion. And we have a fashion parade on on Thursday, Friday and Saturday at 2, 4 and 8 uh, from Rundles with menswear and Waltons with women's wear. First time for Newcastle show. How does Newcastle rate on the show circuit? Well, it'd have to be the sixth biggest show in Australia, I would think. I think it's still bigger than Canberra show and would be the biggest show outside the metropolitan cities. So you're recommending to everyone to bring their money along? Oh, well, why not? Certainly. Forty people were treated in hospital after drums of methylperithion, a chemical used to manufacture insecticide, burst in a hot box at the Kimcon chemical plant at North Wyre, spreading toxic fumes. The fibro wall of the factory was shattered and burning chemicals gave off fumes that affected 30 firemen, five police, three employees and two ambulancemen. But late yesterday, the Pollution Control Commission gave the all clear. For operations to resume today. Chemcon Managing Director John O'Brien said all employees had been given the OK after being sent to hospital for blood tests. daunting task, but another step was taken towards spreading the message of understanding and fellowship at last night's interfaith service. 
Representatives from the Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist and Baha'i religions join together to listen to prayers and selected writings of peace. Despite the different teachings of each group, they all share the same message. Yes. Well, this is, this is a box. I call it a pagoda. I know what a pagoda is. It's a, it's a, it's a Japanese... Uh, what's the name? You know now? Right. Well, that's a pagoda. Meet Rex Sinclair. Now, he's been a pagoda, magician for 64 years and he's still going strong. <laughs> for the past 14 years, he's passed that wealth of knowledge onto would-be mandrakes you didn't through see the Young People's Theatre Magic School. School. Some of them have lasted a complete year before they've... Uh, decided they've had uh, enough. Some of them come along and uh, after one term they find it's a bit beyond them and some of them have turned out semi-professionals and professionals. While and most magicians guard the secrets three again, of their tricks jealously, Rex and can't the afford that luxury. There. I had another extra sponge. And when I put this one down here, I put that extra sponge under it. So that when I put this one on there, and that one on here, the one you see, is the one that I slid underneath when nobody was looking. The rapport that 82-year-old Rex has with children oh. comes from Have years of entertainment. He claims Stay his away. good humour has are. helped him through. Yeah, that'll do. That's near enough now. Turn around and laughter laughter is look at the audience. Hmm? Now, I want them to laugh so you look natural. <laughs> That's funny, they did. Now, Rex you know says while he's known me? around the traps as a my magician, uncle. he gained his real yeah, fame from his ventriloquist He's a bit off his rocker. You'll be off your rocker if you don't keep quiet. Do you go to Every Wednesday afternoon, I went up there. I used to cart this doll up to uh, Sandgate. And all of a sudden, I woke up by myself. This is radio. Nobody sees anything. Only some stupid bloke on a turntable in the other room. So I got a handkerchief say Newcastle. wrapped around my hand and I just used to sit there and <laughs> <laughs> out of it. Okay, tonsillitis. <laughs> what do you call me? Do you call them tonsillitis, Rex? But tonsillitis is a pain in the neck. That's right. See, I can't win with a doll like that. You've got While the fingers two, may not be as nimble like as they once were, well, Rex the still has the tricks on Yeah, behind there. Yeah. And he well, intends to what keep happens. on you showing very his closely. hand for as long as he can. At my age now, I don't do much professional work. It's, uh, very little, if possible. A few old age pensioner shows, or a few kiddies' birthday parties, and this is more or less my life now. And you made your fame with Horace here? Uh, yes, I think... The Newcastle Junior Fishing Clinic holds fishing schools twice a year at Point Wollstonecroft Sport and Recreation Camp. Each budding angler is given a tackle box and hand drill and expert tuition on their use. Then there's the opportunity for hands-on experience in one of the numerous boats owned by the clinic. The most important aspects of the camp, according to organiser Alan Clark, are water safety and conservation. I will emphasise safety at all times out in boats, the need to have responsible persons in charge of boats and the crews being responsible because water does not give second chances. The other thing on top of the water safety, they're going to learn conservation and preservation of the fish which we are going to need for food supplies in the 21st century. When these young anglers head home tomorrow, it's hoped they not only tasted a new lifestyle, but also a fish they've caught themselves.
32 crews from all over the nation, including one from Western Australia, are in Newcastle this weekend to contest the title, which carries the prize money of some $7,000. 42 short races will be run across the two days. Favourites are Gavin Jones' Sia from Manly and Dennis Tanko's Esprit Light Cooler from the St George Club in Sydney. And both remain undefeated after today's racing, as do local hotshots Michael Turner's Sylvania GTE and Pacific Poker Machines with David Anstey. More than a third of the boats represent the clubs in the Hunter and Central Coast, with eight of the top ten from the recent nationals in attendance. A special aspect of the races is their close proximity to the clubhouse, which makes viewing very accessible. Maitland in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales and you soon reach a tiny place called Duckenfield. Once there, you can't afford to miss a visit to Sunshine Farm, owned by brothers Ross and Stuart Taylor. Apart from dairying and vegetable growing on the fertile alluvial plains, the brothers have another pastime. Ross is an incurable collector. A lot of really interesting things I have. Yeah, yeah it's unreal really. Um, what you can pick up. Ross has converted a back room of his modest farming cottage into a showroom for his bottle collection. He has literally thousands, some dating from last century. These marble bottles are among his favourites. The glass marble and a rubber ring were used to seal the top of the bottle. Then these torpedo bottles might take your interest. They would be laid on their side just to keep the cork wet. That was dug up in uh, the coach top in Maitland. When Cobb and Co used to go through uh, Maitland, what that somebody was dug just, up there? Somebody just threw it out of the coach. Yeah, mm, that was dug up there. That that one. It's, a, it's not a bad bottle, that. But, but there's a lot it more is. than this expanding it's bottle there. collection there's on the farm. After you've been here a while, it seems that Ross and his brother Stuart will collect just about anything. And that's evidence in the 53 Morris Miners they have in a paddock. They've got every model ever produced. The first Morris Miner dates back to 1949, and they were mass-produced until 1962. So, what's the attraction? They're really like they're really like a Meccano set. They're all screwed up. Everything unbolts. Everything unbolts. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, what they're like um, till you work on them. They're so easy. Everything is it's just like a Meccano set. Really, it is. Ross is not exactly sure what he'll do with all the old cars. He's restored a few over the years, but spare parts for that sort of thing are pretty hard to come by. But he denies that his paddock has turned into a graveyard for the classic old cars. It's not a graveyard, nothing's a graveyard till something's buried. And, uh, uh, but these are still, they might be sick, but uh, they're, not, uh, they're not under the ground yet, so they're, <laughs> they're not the graveyard. So. Uh, Ross has big plans for his retirement. He's been collecting just about anything you can't bowl down with the vision of one day establishing a museum. The back shed is full of old pictures, radios, film projectors, farm machinery and so much more. Ross says he doesn't look at the value of his many and varied collections. It just gives him personal pleasure, a distraction from the monotony of milking the cows. That's why security is limited to a trusting friend watching over the jumbled array of goodies, waiting for Ross to decide what he's going to do with it all. In the meantime, this human bowerbird just keeps on collecting and collecting and collecting. of home to get down to some serious camping at Tokal. The idea to provide this type of therapy began in Sydney four years ago and its popularity has spread throughout Australia. 
In the last year, countries such as the United States, Wales and New Zealand have adopted the concept. Today in Newcastle, Assistant Director for Camp Quality, Lorna Burdekin, said that the emphasis to enrich the children's lives rests on the generosity and the dedication of the community. We need a network of community involvement for Camp Quality to continue. Um, each local camp is responsible for staffing and funding of its own camp, so that we're always looking for funding. Fortunately, we do have funds in hand, but it's an ongoing activity. Conductor Peter Boyce today said that Kay's unique ability to inspire energy and enthusiasm in his young admirers left the biggest impression on the band. These pictures were taken just two weeks after the film star underwent a major heart operation. For the marching koalas, Danny Kay's memory will live on. I want to make it absolutely clear that it's not the government closing the dockyard. This dockyard has been closed because of the decision of the men on the job to reject the reform package that could have saved 180 jobs. And that's a thing of great regret, both for this government and indeed for Newcastle. Why the dockyard will be closed, Mr Brereton's be statement came as a response to the remaining 180 dockyard workers voting to remain on strike. Continuing their refusal to accept retrenchment without regard for seniority and without prior right of appeal. Now, for the union movement, the battle seems all but over. The dockyard's closed. I don't imagine the government will reverse its decision. So what's the next move for the union movement? Uh, the trade union movement will continue uh, to conduct their campaign. They will continue to picket. They will continue uh, to go out to other workshops and raise the issues uh, uh, with them. Speculation uh, over the future of the dockyard will now uh, enter I a new phase. Mr Brereton says the dockyard will be put out to public tender. The floating dock will remain in Newcastle and all indentured apprentices Process will be found alternative I'll employment. Just say that, that the government in those public tenders will be looking for the, uh, for the best tender that will create the most jobs in the Newcastle region. Phones are running hot at Trades Hall as union officials come to grips with the government's decision. Workers have stepped up their picket at the dockyard with banners and signs. Trades Hall Secretary Peter Barrick said a number of unions, including maritime and metal workers, have offered to take strike action, but they are being requested to contribute to a fighting fund instead. But as I indicated, we'll need to make an evaluation of where the campaign goes from here, uh, taking the announcements of the government yesterday. Delegates are now meeting at Trades Hall to decide what to do. Mr Barrick says despite pleas by the Western Australian Government, the Pilbara will not be released from the floating dock. This afternoon, these confidential documents will be released by Mr Barrick. He says they show that the State Government refused for three years to take top-level advice on how to improve the dockyard's economic performance. Uh, we believe that they clearly demonstrate uh, over a number of years, the Minister has ignored advice uh, from his chosen board of directors who have the responsibility for the commercial viability of the dockyard. Uh, he's chosen to ignore the, the advice uh, to the commercial detriment of the dockyard. Sunny day for days was taking shape in the twin towns of Foster Tun Curry. 
Sorry, the runners on the second route of the marathon were getting ready for the road ahead. Route 2 takes the runners to Newcastle along the coastline and its runners will use various means of transport, including oyster plants, rubber ducks and catamarans across the Mile Lakes and Port Stephens. But today it was all on bitumen as the Foster Tun Curry team plotted its way towards the Holiday Haven area of Pacific Palms. On the open road, one or two joggers ran at a time, while others had a breather in the escort van. One runner, 42-year-old Roger Kershaw, used the run as a warm-up for the Great Lakes Triathlon in a few weeks. The team passed the baton onto the runners from the Pacific Palms at the local recreation club. The run to Bulladilla on the winding mountain road is one of the tougher legs of the marathon and those runners reached their destination mid-afternoon. On the route from the Upper Hunter, the Meriwar team had a big day running from their hometown and finishing in Musselbrook late this afternoon. Those routes will continue tomorrow morning from Bulladilla and Musselbrook and as well, another group of teams will begin the journey from Gloucester. The man was operating a front-end loader at the Civil Asphalt plant at the time of the accident. Police say that at about 7.30 yesterday morning, Colin Frederick Wilkins was loading a storage bin with blue metal dust. The dust which is carried by a conveyor may have become clogged. The result was that Wilkins climbed into the bin and fell. It's believed he was suffocated and died before help arrived. Three other men were working on the site at the time, but in different areas. Nobody witnessed the accident. Rescue teams freed the man and a post-mortem will be held today. From the four corners of the Hunter Valley, teams of runners set off for Newcastle carrying a message from the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke. From Murrurundi, six teams took turns in running 340 kilometres. From the twin towns of Foster Town Curry over three days, teams even took to the water. The Upper Hunter was a difficult leg with winding uphill runs. The shortest route from Belmont included a stint on water skis. But finally, the four days came to an end as the runners converged for the final run to the steps of City Hall, taking with them the support of communities from all over the Hunter, banding together with one aim, the education of children in the fight against drugs. State and federal politicians listened intently as the Lord Mayor, Lord, Alderman John McNaughton, read the message from the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, whose own family has been affected drugs. by drugs. While governments have given a strong lead, we can only hope to succeed in our efforts against drug abuse if there is widespread and strong community support. I'm encouraged by the evidence that there is strong support for what is being done. There can be no better example of how progress can be made by cooperation between governments, community organisations and the general public than the Hunter, Hunter Life Education Centre project. The Commonwealth and State Governments have jointly provided $128,000 as a capital grant for your new centre. Telethon 87 will help provide the remainder needed to complete the Hunter Life Education Centre. On this basis of shared support, the people of the Hunter region will be able to use a much needed addition to the facilities available in their local area to further the vital tasks of educating young people about the effects of drugs. It's not the easy way there on the outside. But Some 24 drivers from Canberra, Sydney, Sydney and the Hunter area will be competing in the $1,000 first prize classic with some exciting challenges expected. Madawi driver Bob Brewer is returning in a new Monte Carlo and is expected to give current New South Wales and ACT champion John Pine some tough competition. Pine, who's been almost unbeatable in past weeks, could have his hands full. Apart from Brewer, 
Graham Cowboy Luford steps out of Grand Nationals into a Buick for tomorrow's Classic, as does John Brown, who'll be one to watch in a Camaro. Canberra stars Russell Heaton, Peter Bink and Nick Girdleston will also be here. In the solos, newly crowned ACT champion Todd Wiltshire will line up against New South Wales champ Chris Watson and all the top New South Wales riders in challenge heats culminating in an eight-rider feature race. Sidecars will also feature in an eight-rider final. St Patrick's Day means a change of plans when you've gone to work in your black and tans. March the 17th, I should have known that I'd be sent out to kiss the Blarney Stone. A quick change of clothes and I'm dressed in green, complete with four-leaf clover or the nearest thing I've seen. According to folklore, it brings you lots of luck. Though it doesn't help with poetry, I keep on getting stuck. St Patrick's Day means Ireland, Ireland and the beauty of the land, sight. its rustic Fertile charm and castles, and ancient ruins islands. that still stand. Ancient St Patrick's ruins. Day is the warmth of a truly Irish, Irish smile, but not everyone stop, can travel to the sparkling Island Emerald Isle. So today, Norway, in Sydney, the City morning, Council turned four fountains islands. to lime. The reason? Well, it stopped the larrikins from doing it this time, and publicans serve special fare from morning, noon and night, with Irish stew and baileys and pints of Guinness light. In Newcastle, the party was a more sedate affair. At Lloyd's, the strains of Irish ballads filled the air. The patron saint of Ireland would be pleased to see this brew. It's dubbed a Bailey shamrock and it's Irish through and through. And so, until this time next year, I raise my glass to say, I hope you've had a magical St Patrick's Day. The Markle and Thomas Hinder it was a case of Newcastle revisited today. The Sydney-based artist completed the then controversial Copper Fountain in Civic Park 20 years ago, amid many battles over its cost and Margle's determination not to compromise her original concept. Today the sad consequence of time has taken its toll on the fountain. And I hate that brown scum that's on it, but uh, I know that the water does that to all brown things. Uh, this isn't bronze, this is copper. But, uh, same thing in the sense as bronze. So uh, I the more I look at it, the more dense I can see in it, you know, where people have hurled things at it. Jets and lights will be replaced and the copper work will have to be scrubbed back and restored. The cost of the project is still being assessed, but the project engineer says the fountain will be out of action for two weeks after Easter. The task force has launched a series of high-powered briefings outlining the advantages of building the submarines in Newcastle. Today's briefing was held at Newcastle City Hall, which seems a bit like preaching to the converted, as, understandably, those present already supported Newcastle's bid. But the task force believes it's important to show the local community the case it's presenting to the government. The case for Newcastle is by far the superior case, and I should add, that the support that we've had from Newcastle, the support group, uh, members of parliament uh, here and from the City Council has been of great significance because there's strong community support uh, for this project and I know the builders realise that uh, a decision in favour of Newcastle will have total community support. The message from the task force is clear. Newcastle should get the contract because it can do the best job. But there's no doubt it would give Newcastle's economy a big boost, just the sort of incentive needed for the task force to leave no stone unturned in their efforts to promote Newcastle's case. Next week, uh, on Thursday, we will be making presentations to uh, federal members of parliament in Canberra 
uh, over a lunchtime presentation, heads of federal government departments. Next Friday, for example, uh, state members of parliament at Parliament House in Sydney and in the afternoon to the Labor Council. The 2-metre 11-centimetre giant arrived last month to join the ranks of the Falcons for 1987. His decision to head back to the States comes as a shock to both the team and coach Steve Johansson. Well, Greg said he had uh, some family problems over He still had his wife in the States and uh, there was a problem there to start with. And uh, they had a few traumas as soon as he moved out here with one thing or another and uh, he thought he'd better go home and try and sort them out. Does it highlight any problems with the import rules, so to speak? Well, there's always a problem because you never know what sort of player you're going to uh, get anyway, but uh, there are quite a few that come out for a few days and go home because they're homesick. And I think a lot of the problem is they don't realise that the competition is pretty tough and, and they've got to perform when they get here. Now, how's that affected the team's preparation? Well, it set us back a couple of weeks, I guess you could say, but uh, there's still a few other teams that are waiting for their imports to come and hopefully uh, we've got agents working for us over there and we can uh, get somebody pretty quickly within the next two weeks. So you'll be looking back in the States for a replacement for Greg? Yeah, we've got an agent that we met when we went over there looking for us and uh, a lot of the players are coming back from uh, Argentina and the Continental League's finished so there should be a few players floating around. Now you've got a big match on Saturday, a pre-season match against Dillawarra. How do you rate the chances for that? Well, I'm pretty hopeful. Uh, both teams will be under strength and uh, it'll give our guys a chance, the Australian players we've got and the young kids that we've got this year, give them a chance to find out what it's all about against other competition and uh, oh, I'm pretty hopeful we'll do very well I think. It's expected to be an exciting night of racing as local drivers and test team members Graham Lilford, John Smith, Ron Pine and Ralph Ranger vie to keep the title in Newcastle. Strong competition is expected to come from Queensland driver Alan Butcher. Butcher will be using the Masters as vital preparation for the Easter weekend's $12,000 Winfield Nationals. That's a race he's already won three times. Sydney drivers Walter Giles, Ken Laws, Cole Robinson and Barry Waite are also expected to press hard for the lead in the feature event. Also on the program tomorrow night is the Hunter Valley Street Stock Sedan Championships, which has already attracted 30 entries. Angelo Cecil and Jack Peet start in that event as equal favourites. Formula 500s, UFO sprints and modified hot rods will also be featured in tomorrow night's racing. According, According to the police, to the police Ronald Smith, Smith failed to stop when they tried to flag him down at a random breath testing unit. Police gave chase, catching up when he stopped in his driveway in Empire Bay Drive. A struggle took place and a police service revolver discharged. Smith was hit in the upper part of his left arm and shoulder. The commotion woke Smith's wife Debbie, who was asleep in their home. I saw police there with, with my car. Um, my husband had been taken to hospital. Smith was rushed to Gosford Hospital where he underwent surgery for the bullet wound. He is in a satisfactory condition. At this stage, no charges have been laid in relation to the incident. But the police have interviewed Smith in hospital and the departmental investigation is continuing.